How do you even follow on for that? Amazing. Um, big job ahead. <laughs> so I'll start with this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I went round to my fiance's aunt's house for breakfast, baps, and coffee. And she said to me, so how are you? How are things going, Ness? And I said, yeah, you know, pretty good, not too bad. My expedition planning is going pretty solidly, so I'm happy with that. But I'm just trying to wrap my head around some of the more complex life alone at sea issues. And so she said, well, what's the problem? And I took a deep dive for a few minutes into explaining the extraordinary amount of preparation that goes in to spending six to nine months alone at sea in a tiny ocean rowing boat in the middle of a huge ocean, the most extreme environment that I can personally think on, of on this planet. And I talked about how I would have to be leashed to the boat in case of rough weather and I get strewn from the boat or capsize happens and I'm separated from her my only means of survival out there, how I will at any point in time have the closest contact being astronauts 90 miles above on the International Space Station, how I will have to uh, use a desalinator to create my own drinking water out there and live off freeze-dried packets of food for six to nine months, and uh, beautifully how my toilet compromises of pooping into a bucket for six months um, and being really, really careful about balancing that in rough conditions. <laughs> and um, she looks at me and there's this long, drawn out silence, followed by, oh, <laughs> that's lovely. So tell me, Ness, how are the dogs? And I'm like, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the dogs, the dogs are great. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, but this happens quite a lot, where people find it really difficult to wrap their hand around uh, what it is that I do. And people tend to ask me, you know, what do you do for a living? And I'll say, well, you know, I'm an explorer and quite chuffed with that. And they look at me and they say, what does that even mean these days? And to be honest with you, the job title doesn't exist for the most part. I mean, in the drop-down forms on uh, those online forms for occupation, <laughs> this doesn't exactly list explorer and adventurer. So officially, my job title, uh, sadly, is just other. Um, <laughs> but I suppose the most apt job description is that I specialize in making a living out of hauling everything that I need to survive with me around some of the most remote corners of our planet and telling the story of those experiences. Ultimately, I guess I'm a storyteller. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was some of the lessons and experiences that I've had out there from exp expeditions around the globe that have fundamentally changed my perspective and how I define and pursue happiness in my life. Now, uh, as mentioned, I have just announced to the world um, the launch of my next expedition, which is to row solo, or to be the first female in history, to row solo, non-stop, and unassisted across the Pacific Ocean, which is about 7,000 miles, but you never do it in a straight line, so it's more like spaghetti, so they'll probably end up being about 9,000. Um, but yeah, the, I got a question actually recently from a journalist that I wanted to tell you about, and I've left it through there, so I'll try and remember it correctly. But he did say to me, why would you risk losing everything to go out there, pushing your limits and your boundaries in these extreme environments? You could lose it all. Most people would look at you and ask, are you sure you're sane? Now, I was thinking about how to answer that question. And in all fairness, I'm not sure if you can actually be the judge of your insanity. So I'll leave that bit up to you guys. Just don't tell me your answers. <laughs> um, but let's get back to the why. Why do I do what I do? And that is a fair question indeed. And to answer that, I'm going to tell you the story about giving everything that I have to do and achieve what most people think is absolutely impossible. Um, my mom would tell you that the story began when I was a little girl, six or seven, streaking across our lawn towards the treehouse in relative safety because she was running after me with her skirts in one hand, wagging a finger in the other, saying, you girl better get in the bathtub today and get that mud scrubbed off. And it was a real chore to do that. I loved the, outs the outdoors in the wilderness, you know, as a little kid. And to be honest, it's not much has changed in terms of getting that mud scrubbed off, so credit to my fiancé for sticking through that. Um, but it's, that little girl of six or seven had a wild and vivid imagination. She lived in a world of indescribable beauty, where anything was possible, where heroines were born out of adversity, where superpowers were the norm, and where great expeditions of exploration to uncharted worlds were constantly underway. 
amazing, really, how many universes you can travel to in a tiny cardboard box. Now, my first taste of real wilderness, grown-up wilderness and real expeditions happened about a decade ago in a journey I did that took me into the deep, dark depths of the Bolivian jungle uh, to an animal sanctuary that I wanted to work at there. Um, and now I'd love to say to you guys that I was this born explorer um, and a complete natural, but you know, I didn't come out of the room with a compass in one hand and I don't know, like zoology book in the other, unfortunately. And I really struggled on my first expeditions. And uh, anyone who looks at me back then would have laughed when, you, when you know, I said to them, well, this is what I do now. Um, but, you know, that didn't put me off too much. I, I remember, though, so many things going on wrong with that expedition, and in a way I fell in love with that kind of spontaneous, spontaneity and trying to battle against the, the odds. Um, I remember waking up one morning in a hospital, and this was really on an expedition, and I had no idea how I got there. Um, and to this day, I actually don't know what I was diagnosed with because I didn't speak a word of Spanish. So rule number one, try and learn a few words of the place that you're going to, the country, um, so you can actually communicate with them. But I do remember snippets of my time uh, in hospital. And one of them was when I was sent out across this dusty courtyard to the outside toilet block. And they wanted me to get a stool sample for analysis. So I stumbled along there, you know, get into the cubicle, shut the door, and plonk myself down on the toilet. And I can just feel that I'm not alone in here. There are eyes beaming down at me from behind. And I turn around, and I see this guy. Now, this was not just any ordinary no monkey. These capuchins, there were a handful of them living in and around the, the local hospital and the sanctuary, the animal sanctuary. And they were rehabilitating them because they were rescued from cities where they were trained thieves. So this guy was a pickpocket. And today, he had his eyes on a particularly alluring prize, which was the stool sample bottle in my hand. Um, as you can imagine, things didn't really go to plan. I could see the envy in his eyes as he looked from me to the bottle and back to me, and I knew this was going to be war. Um, and I have to say, it was quite something trying to wrestle a monkey away while simultaneously trying to poop into a tiny jar while you have dysentery. And um, I think that's probably the definition of stupidity. But I was adamant that I was going to do the job at hand. Um, there were many lessons to be learned out there in the jungle. Um, if you ever find yourself in the jungle without toilet paper, choose wisely the leaf that you use because not all leaves are created equal and I did not know this. So a really awkward trip to the vet's office uh, confirmed that the huge rash on my derriere was the result of DIY jungle loo roll. Um, they deemed me of questionable intelligence and I was smart enough not to argue that. Um, this trip came to a very abrupt end one morning when I was woken up early to be told that my boyfriend at the time had snapped his arm in half trying to get a monkey down from a tree. <laughs> so it was a pretty apt ending to that journey. But the seeds of adventure and the love for it had been sown. Uh, and through all the things that went, went wrong out there, I really fell in love with the fauna and the flora and the wilderness out there. And going into the unknown, that was, that was my comfort zone. Being uncomfortable is some, something that I'm very comfortable with. Um, but that wasn't the only thing that had a big shift in my perspective in my life that kind of was a catalyst for me making this career and forging a career as an adventurer and explorer, which is somewhat unusual. Um, even now, I'm surrounded by beards and men. Um, so a few statistics that really hit home with me over the years have been this. Uh, on average, in our life, we have around 27,000 days to live. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a very long time at all when you really think about it. And for me, part of you know, pursuing this career was that intention really to live each and every single one of the 16,000 or so days that I hope I have left fully, honestly, and wholeheartedly. Uh, another statistic that really got me, which uh, Emma, who spoke earlier, probably resonate with her, um, the amount of time that us Brits, specifically us Brits, spend indoors inside four walls out of all of our time is 92%. And I just, that boggles my mind. I actually cannot wrap my head around it. You know, if you think about that, you know, in total, out of 27,000 days, we're spending 25,000 of them inside four walls. And that's ridiculous. That's absolutely bonkers. And for me personally, I was just not willing to continue in the job that I had all those years ago, sat behind a computer, locked into this room from nine to five, and just ticking other people's boxes and paying bills and really not living passionately. So that was a huge, huge motivating factor for me. 
I'll fast forward now to an expedition that I've just come back from recently. And that is a journey that I made to one of the most remote parts of the world, Namibia, specifically northern Namibia. Um, this over here was the journey that I did, started right at the top there on the banks of the Kanini River, and that over there is the border with Angola. Um, it's one thing trying to plan an expedition from halfway around the world, it sat in an office in London on, with Google Maps, and you think you have an idea what to expect out there, but it's absolutely nothing compared to what life is like on the ground there. Um, one of the big lessons that I learned out there is if you ever go on an adventure or an expedition, leave your ego at the table because there's no room for that. Use local knowledge. So I went out there not knowing and understanding that I was heading straight into a country that was really struggling with a three-year drought that they'd been gripped in. Um, the northern region of Namibia was absolutely sucked dry of all of its life. All the fauna, uh, sorry, all the, all the animals and all the, the tribes, the nomadic tribes had moved down south. Um, so I had planned to cache just a few of my lots of water at waypoints along the way, uh, but I hadn't planned for this. And so I really, really struggled. Every single water source, natural water source that I was supposed to be relying on all the way down was another dry riverbed and another dry riverbed and a dried up waterhole. Um, so it was a sobering start to an expedition where I knew right from the word go that I would absolutely be struggling with dehydration for long periods of this expedition and that I would definitely have a knock-on effect on the kind of decisions that I'd be making because my head would not be 100% with it. So from that point of at that point, right at the start, I should have been a little bit more aware and on it, um, but I wasn't. Um, so as I headed down south, uh, about two, two weeks in, I hit uh, an area that was kind of had signs of some of the life and wildlife thriving, which I knew I was getting into lion territory now and elephant territory. Now, you can't pass through lion territory without having a lion warden with you. So I had a chap called Fritz and he was incredible. Uh, and he, I would have felt a lot better about him being with me, except for the fact that most of the time, he spent his time kind of over the ridge line, round the corner, down the valley, and across the dry riverbed, about three or four miles away from me, scouting. And uh, that's great. But I said, Fritz, you know, what happens if you go off and scout and you don't see anything around you? And then over that ridge line comes a pride of lion directly through our path. I'm cut off from you. There's nothing that I can do, and there's nothing that you can do. How do I react? What do I do? And uh, he looks at me and says, well, don't do anything stupid. So, like, <laughs> okay, what constitutes doing something stupid in front of a pride of lions? You know, like, does walking away, is that, is that stupid? You know, is like staring at them in the eyes? Like, I don't know what to do. Do I shout? Do I make myself look big? I have no idea, Fritz. And he says, okay, here's what you're going to do. So you see this pride of lions in front of you. What's going to happen is that you're going to stand still. And when one of those lions turns its head and looks right at you with its eyes, you're going to calmly take a deep breath, take a step to the side, and then take a big step back. And slowly and calmly look them in the eyes. And if they start moving towards you, you're going to take a step to the right, and you're going to take a big step back. I said to him, OK, Fritz, now, I get this. I get the logic of like stepping back, and I understand that. But you know, I didn't really want to admit to him that I couldn't understand <laughs> the logic of the zigzagging backwards and forwards. So Fritz, okay, Sorry, you're going to have to tell me, like, what is going on here? And he has this little twinkle in his eye, and he says, okay, here's what's going to happen, for real. Is you're going to stand there, and that lion's going to turn its head towards you and look, in, look you in the eyes, and you're going to feel fear like you've never felt in your life before. And you're going to poop yourself. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a step to the left, yeah, and a big step back. And now they're going to start walking towards you, and you're going to poop yourself again. So you're going to take a step to the right and a nice big step back. And that's going to happen until you're far enough away that you feel safe or you run out of poop. And then you just back up anyway. So I said, OK, so this is how it's going to go. All right, brilliant. Anyway, conditions out there were absolutely stinking hot. Every single day, the temperature was right up into about 45 degrees Celsius. And by this point, I was really, really, really struggling. Now, the day that things went really wrong in Lion Territory was the day that it peaked at, 50, at 49 degrees Celsius. Um, by 1 p.m., I, I was in bad shape, really bad shape. Now, from midday to 3 o'clock every day, I would normally only 
be on the side looking for shade or sleeping. I would not be out cycling. But I was really nervous about the fact that I was in line territory. And all my instincts said to me, get through here as fast as you can. So I was pushing through hours of the day that I definitely normally would not do. And that's where it went wrong. So now I'm going, and Fritz is ahead of me. And uh, I'm really feeling it. I've, I've got this out of body experience, and things are just starting to go a bit weird. And I get this radio call down from Fritz. And he says to me, listen, Ness, um, you know, you're going to come across uh, this area ahead of you where you, I need you to be really careful because there's a fresh line kill from last night. Now, you're going to come around the river bend, follow and track that driver of a bed, and you're going to look to the right, and you're going to see the vultures in the sky. And then you're going to look further down on the ground, and you're going to see the jackals. So I'm just letting you know, just be aware, have your wits about you, and get through there calmly and safely. So I said, OK, Fritz, I've got that. That's fine. So now with me and my bad timing, as I usually have, you know, like uh, just things always go wrong around me, I get about 200 meters from the fresh lion kill, and I lose consciousness. <laughs> I black out completely. Um, and the next thing I remember is waking up in Fritz's defender. And he had this gut instinct and feeling that something was not right and came back for me. Now, if he hadn't come back for me, God knows I might have been wandering those planes in complete delirium or worse. I have no idea. Um, but I'd made a string of bad decisions leading up to this, where I had let my anger and the environment control me. And Fritz, his first words to me were, all right, I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear right now. And I thought, great, here we go. You know, here's a lecture. And he says, you need to stop trying to control nature because you can't. And you need to stop being angry at the harsh conditions out here because it's, this is not going to get you anywhere. This is going to change your mindset for the worst, and you've got this negative dialogue going on, and you're making bad decisions out there. You cannot change nature. The problem is not the heat. It's not your body. It's not the wilderness around you and the environment. The problem is your mind. And when you change your mindset, you change your outcome. And you, girl, need to focus. And I was like, OK. Like, seriously, you're going to tell me you're going to lecture me when I'm feeling like crap, and I've just passed out. You know? And you're like, who do you think you are? And who Fritz was was someone who had lived for 30 years out in Africa under the stars. And he knew everything that there was to know about survival. And not just surviving, but thriving amongst the lion, the hyena, the, the jackals, everything, all the, all the harsh environments out there. He knew it. And he was right. And that's where I had to take a step back and look at the situation and realize that I needed to start conditioning my mind once again to stop far focusing and worrying about all the things that were going wrong and that I couldn't change, and focus rather on the things that I could change to make progress. And sometimes that's going to come down to the very smallest possible next step. So you see that rock over there? That's, that's my next step. And so all I need to do right now is go from here to that rock. And I'm not going to think about anything beyond that rock. And that's how I did the rest of that expedition, is bit by bit by bit. And checking myself and checking whether I was making the right decisions bit by bit. Um, I'd let those bad decisions run riot. And, and you know, that was a huge lesson to me out there. When you're under a huge amount of pressure, especially in these extreme environments, um, yeah, you, you basically find that the very smallest things become friction points. And you have to be very careful of that. Uh, so yeah, this was waking up. Uh, one of the most amazing things I had out there in experiences was waking up uh, in this cave that I stumbled across. That was You won't find this on Google. Nobody even knows about this. Um, but I woke up early in the morning, and I, I put my flashlight on the top of the ceiling. And there was this amazing 2,000-year-old Bushman paintings on the rocks. It was incredible. And I remember looking out you know, across the plains and just thinking, I, I feel really, truly humbled by the fact that you know. I know that people for thousands of years have sat on this very same rock looking out at this very same view. Um, so it was one of the most incredible experiences out there. But one of the things that, oh, this, um, yeah, that over there was an interesting one. I kept coming across these, and that is a giraffe bone. Uh, so if they can take down something the size of a giraffe, I'm easy prey, very easy prey. So now this mindset of going bit by bit and, and tiny bit, you know, Breaking things right back down to the very smallest step is how I'm basically going to get from here, oh, from here in North America all the way down to the finish line in Australia. It's going to be done one day at a time, one hour at a time, and one oar stroke at a time. And there's no space for complacency, and there's no space for those bad decisions and bad moves, moods. Um, before I wrap up, uh, I wanted to ask you guys to actually do something for me this evening when you head home and you have your, your glasses of wine. And that is, 
uh, get a piece of paper out and write a list of all the things that you would attempt to do if you knew you could not fail. Because for me, one of the biggest problems that we have is that we all have this fear of failure. We come across all these hurdles in our life that we think are reasons why we can't achieve what we really, truly want to achieve in life. And I want you to, to go and do that. Um, but all in all, I think I've come full circle back down to that uh, six or seven year old girl who believed that anything is possible. And perhaps one of the greatest jobs that we can all do is ensure that our children and the next generation don't lose that innate belief in the first place. Thank you. Yeah.